Well, thank you again. Really appreciate you making the time today to join us. Again, my name is Chris Kissel. I'm a Senior Associate Director of Corporate Partnerships in the School of Computer Science. And I'd like to welcome you to today's conversation called the School of Computer Science Capstone Roundtable. And uh, admittedly, it's a, a very exciting topic for me as I started my interactions with CMU when I was in industry in a capstone project. And I enjoyed coming to campus, getting to know the students and the faculty and uh, seeing some of the student work was absolutely incredible. So it's my pleasure today to uh, welcome you and to learn a little, about, a little bit about some of the capstones that are available within the school. So we have a, a small subset of capstones today. We have developed a brochure and a website that you can check out at your leisure that talks about the other uh, opportunities for you to explore. And um, I'll, actually, I'll add that to the chat now so you can take a look at that uh, when you have time. So love to give you some maybe a lay of the land for today's conversation. Uh, we have some special guests and we would like to introduce them. Uh, today, uh, we have our introductions at the beginning and then we're gonna transition into allowing a team from Honda, both Dwayne and Rajiv, to speak about their experience engaging in capstones within the School of Computer Science and the value that they see as part of that type of engagement. And then we'll transition into a roundtable discussion with several capstones that you'll find in the School of Computer Science. So uh, without further ado, uh, we will get started. And as you listen in on the conversation, if at any time you think of a question that you'd love to ask, uh, you have the ability to ask a question using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen in the Zoom toolbar. We'll keep an eye on those questions and we'll be able to uh, pop some of those up in the conversation. So uh, yeah, really want you to participate if at all possible. So uh, thank you again. And let me now pivot to some of the introductions around the room. So I'll start out with our Honda folks and uh, we'll kick off with Dwayne and Rajiv. Would you mind introducing yourselves? Hi, Chris, thanks. Hello everyone and good afternoon. My name is Dwayne Detweiler. I've actually been with Honda now for 27 years. I'm in the role of senior chief engineer and VP of Research for Honda Research Institute to USA, which includes our collaborative activity at 99P Labs. Good to be part of the conversation today, thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Chris, for inviting us. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Rajiv uh, Chajir. I'm also at Honda Research Institute. I'm a chief engineer here, and I lead the Software Defined Mobility Research Domain. Excited to be part of the conversation today. It's fantastic to have you both. Thank you again. Uh, I'll turn over to my colleagues over in the School of Computer Science. Uh, we have several faculty who represent uh, different parts of different departments within the school, but also different programs. So love to have them introduce themselves as well. I'll kick, and maybe Carolyn, you can kick us off today. Sure. Hi there. I am Carolyn Rose. I'm a professor of language technologies and human computer interaction. I actually first came to Carnegie Mellon 31 years ago, and I love it. It's uh, it's it's really been a home for my career. Um, uh, I represent the Master of Computational Data Science um, program here. That's a multidisciplinary program where students learn to design, engineer, and deploy very large information systems. And the program rests on three pillars of analytics systems and human computer interaction, where students get a foundation in all three of these, but choose to specialize in one, um, which is their concentration. And then when they form capstone teams, those teams can potentially be composed of students from all three of these concentrations or really focus on one. Um, we have done uh, a, a variety of kinds of capstones, some with industry and some with university uh, sponsors. And these have been um, complex solutions to noisy, incomplete data problems using cutting edge AI and machine learning. Um, and uh, we have a very interactive process of working with industry. And I look forward to talking with many of you. about Skip and Jessica. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Thanks so much for joining us. My name is Jessica Vogt. I'm the engagement manager for our Human Computer Interaction Institute. I manage industry partnerships along with my colleague Skip and one of those partnerships is our capstone program, um, which is a one year project or one year professional program in which we host a capstone project for about eight months. So we're excited to share more about that opportunity with you throughout this call. Thanks, Jessica. I'm Skip Shelley. I'm Associate Teaching Professor in the Human Computer Interaction Institute. 
an alum of the CMU School of Design from a thousand years ago. And um, I'm uh, the director of the Master of Human Computer Interaction uh, master's program here um, where we've been fortunate enough to have Honda as one of our industry partners sponsoring capstones for well on uh, four years now. So excited to hear your questions today and to hear my colleagues talk about their programs. And I think I'm next. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is John Dolan. I'm a faculty member in the Robotics Institute. I do research in mobile robots, including autonomous driving. But for the purposes of uh, this session, I am the director of the Master of Science in Robotic Systems Development program. And that program combines technical robotics with systems engineering and business uh, courses. And we also have a capstone. It's a two semester project course, but it's preceded by one semester of systems engineering. So the teams actually end up spending a full three semesters working on any projects that are sponsored either by industry or faculty members. Last but not least, Nick. Hi, everyone. My name is Nick Martellero. I'm an assistant professor in the Human Computer Interaction Institute, um, but I teach a, <clears throat> excuse me, a capstone, a one semester capstone course that actually spans um, Human Computer Interaction Institute and the uh, College of Engineering and the Electrical Engineering Department, as well as a variety of other departments around campus, including mechanical engineering um, and the School of Design. Uh, it's a rapid prototyping course. Uh, where in one semester students go from an initial problem statement from a corporate sponsor um, all the way to a functional uh, prototype uh, that usually incorporates a mix of uh, embedded computing systems, cloud computing systems, um, and human computer interfaces. So it's a super fast paced course uh, where uh, the entire class actually works together on one team in a variety of some teams. Um, actually Honda here has been one of our sponsors um, for this class, and I'm excited to talk to you about it today. Well, thank you, everyone. And uh, I again, I can't tell you how excited I am to get this group of individuals together. They're just excellent people, and their programs are phenomenal. So, you know, today's the goal of today's conversation is really to help. I think if you're in industry or government and you're trying to understand, you know, some of the ways that you can engage with the students and the faculty. And admittedly, when I was in industry, uh, I was I was actually here uh, at the home office of American Eagle Outfitters at the time. You know, I knew that there was a lot of creativity at the campus and I would love to tap into that. And we had our own challenges. Some things were on the back burner, some things had to be done tomorrow. And so Capstones ended up being a phenomenal way for us to honestly do some recruiting, building the brand and, and talking about the brand in a completely different way. And then uh, just love seeing how the students approach problems differently than how I did. So admittedly, I'm excited about today's conversation. So I'm, I'm really pleased that everyone could join. So uh, to kick off today's conversation, um, you know, Dwayne and Rajiv have spent actually years engaging with us and have just really built the brand in a wonderful way, not only within the School of Computer Science, which is where we're kind of focusing today's conversation, but have really grown across campus um, into different in different schools. So I'd love to hear a little bit from you know Dwayne and Rajiv about your experience with Capstones and how your team really utilizes it as an important part of how your team operates. So I'm excited to learn more. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Yeah, uh, uh, you heard mention there. We we've uh, steadily been growing our our activities with Capstones uh, over the last five years with Carnegie Mellon. Um, and and I want to say, I will talk a little bit about big picture, kind of the value proposition and turn over to my colleague Rajiv, maybe to talk a little bit, uh, give you some more detailed examples. Big picture, two things. Uh, one, so at, at, at the Honda Research Institute, our mission is to, is to innovate through science. And as part of that innovation challenge, there's two, there's two big challenges or struggles that you have. One is, um, honestly, when you think about it from the seeds and needs viewpoint, seeds being kind of technology ideas, technology concepts, honestly speaking, you get too many of those internally. So you have all these ideas coming from the folks uh, within within your team, whoever they might be, and not enough resources to investigate those. So, so one way to do that is to engage the university community. The other one is wondering about the, the problems of future society. So again, we, that, that viewpoint of looking forward to future society is often difficult for any, any individual or any individual company. And so again, we find great value in engaging the student, student community and the faculty, community, faculty that support them at, at the university. So we formed 99P Labs specifically to grow the collaboration with our university partners 
uh, which includes students, faculty, and staff. And and we we that innovation pipeline for that collaboration uh, ranges anywhere from what you can think of as make it, make events or or hack events, eight hours to forty eight hours, um, all the way into uh, capstone programs, which usually run for one semester or two semesters, and oftentimes. Uh, things that come out of there um, that pass the pass it the test of kind of resonating um, both with the students, the faculty, and the researchers within Honda move on to sponsored research projects with our university partners that might involve two to three year projects with masters and PhD students. But today we're here to talk about the capstone engagement, and with that I'll turn it over to Rajiv and let him share some of the details of our engagement with Carnegie Mellon. Yep, absolutely. So uh, let me go ahead and just share my screen real quick. And hopefully you all can see it. I'll just go in full slideshow mode. So today, uh, just just building on what Dwayne uh, was referring as to why we think the capstone as a tool is super important. I think one I want to point out, you know, obviously Chris and his team uh, has been super pivotal in us building multiple relationships and threads across campus. This is just a view. Uh, that you can see across campus of the various programs we have engaged with, right from uh, the MHCI, the human computer interaction, to product management, co computational data science, information security, integrated innovation, uh, corporate startup lab. And I, I almost feel since it's been almost four plus years since we're building and doing these things, we might have possibly missed out one or two of the call outs here. So I apologize for that. But our, our relationships and the number of projects uh, have. Uh, significantly increased on any given year. Today, we are executing about 10 to 12 capstones on uh, the CMU campus, which is in the School of Computer Science to multiple different uh, schools, institutes, uh, programs, and things like that as well. Uh, again, just building off a little bit on what Dwayne was sharing, right? The, the big benefits, we see this as a great platform and tool for multiple different uh, reasons, right? And the four four key reasons that we always talk about is how this integrates back into our work. Uh, Dwayne talked a little bit about the big picture over here, the innovation activity, the education and the community bits, right? Uh, so what happens as, as we think about the future, you know, there, there's a lot of hype around the technology, but start when we start thinking about how we want to solve consumer customer needs or future problems or whatnot, there's obviously roadmaps, right? And the important things, the important, really important key feature is how do we find the right insights that can help us develop opinions, right? So doing these capstones sort of help us validate our hypotheses around our roadmap items also. It enhances our ongoing study. So we, we definitely see that as a key benefit. It's a creation of new research initiatives, right? So as we start solving problems with students and our interactions with faculty, we are inspired by new opportunities that come about, which we may have not thought about on a routine basis as we develop our own roadmaps too. Uh, a big part about it is, is education and training. You know, when we think about it, you know, you have your formal, informal learning methods for our associates uh, internally and across various companies. Uh, I, I see, I particularly see the capstone as a great way for our associates to embed themselves to work with students and learn new methods, new technologies, new problem solving skills. This is a great way to get our associates out of the routine and learn and be part of something that's new, something that's that's innovative, that's something that's collaborative that they don't get to experience on a day-to-day -day basis. And then the, the big thing is like, whatever learnings we get out of the capstone, we share it with our community. And when I say community, I mean both our internal, uh, internal Honda community, which is global Honda, right from our global headquarters in Japan to all, all, all our different regions and our external community, right? So we, as being a research institute, we have a university network. So we share, it's, it's all about a win-win situation so we can all uh, solve problems collaboratively. And then the, the big thing is, uh, as I was mentioning, the shared goals and innovations, but the big thing is we build these long relationships with students, the programs, the faculty, there's so much as a sensing tool. Uh, students who work with us uh, on Capstone pro projects have gone on to do great things after their programs. We've written recommendation letters. They've reached out to us for side projects. They've done internships with us. They've gone on to build companies as well. This, this is a great sort of 
social proof that we get out of these sort of uh, platforms. But then talking, I, I think another big advantage is it gives us an opportunity to talk to a lot of faculty as well and learn about the programs and how the programs are evolving to keep up with the pace of technology and the movement and the kind of uh, areas that are changing. So just want to call out a few of these benefits and how we see this as really a good tool for us from a sensing point of view, learning, education, and community point of view. Uh, again, a key part of all of this boils down to really, you know, creating the right kind of problem statements. And I know there'll, there'll probably be some amount of more deeper discussion, but at least I'd like to share some viewpoints of how we've iterated, right? Day one, year one, we never got the problem right. It's only been through learnings and feedback cycles that we've been able to iterate and come up with something that is, uh, has produced great outcomes, honestly. And I think right at the center of all of this is involving the faculty early on, building a relationship with them, uh, iterating with them and not waiting till really the program starts, right? And the other key thing that I'd like to point out with Capstones is that, uh, you know, it's you shouldn't view that as hired help, right? It's not, try, you're not trying to solve something that's on your critical roadmap of your company direction or whatever it is, or your project direction. These are insights you want to get that are somewhat related, but even if they fail, there's, there's learnings in the failure as well. But the key components as we've iterated through problem statements is having, you know, the, the students, they, it's, it's an amazing set of students across different programs, right? Like how can we have problems that are flexible, that can have, that can be, that can have enough built-in pivots allowed but can challenge their creativity and problem solving skills, right? That's that's a key component. It should be a great learning experience for the students. Uh, and uh, we're learning, we're gaining the insights from that, right? Uh, we have to harness the CMU student community. And I think that's another reason why you uh, keep, uh, you, you have to build a relationship with the faculty because the faculty truly understands the diversity, the skills, the experience, the students bring and they have the right mindset of trying to create the different groups together. Uh, again, understanding and defining the problem, right? Like how broad you can get, how narrow you can get. It's again, with the faculty, you at least have the flexibility built in. And then looking at it from an organic outcome point of view, right? Like you're not asking for a very, very uh, constrained deliverable. Like I need this code, code base to be developed or I need a clear solution to be developed. It's more about the insights, the learnings that come about and you build your outcomes around those. Uh, these can be right from very rough prototypes, MVPs to the key part is the learning process, right? The, the reflective uh, learning that comes out from this, how they went about problem solving, what were the things that were missing? What are the new ideas that spur out? That's what we want to extract and encapsulate as part of this. And then again, it, iteration, right? Without iteration, it's not possible to improve. So anyways, so just, just giving you sort of an example of something that we completed the last just last year, I won't go into the details, but just want to show you an example of how we crafted problem statements. This was a problem statement from uh, the last fall at the Information Insti uh, Networking Institute, a capstone that we did around software engineering. Essentially for us in this problem statement, we wanted to just see what the role of decentralized computing would play as connectivity and uh, uh, automation increases in the vehicle ecosystem or the mobility ecosystem. And really we were not trying to build a solution. We were thinking as compute increases, what are the insights we get about inefficiencies, security concerns, uh, other things that we should be uh, should be thinking about? How do we build trust in that ecosystem? And that this was the, the problem statement that uh, we provided to the students. What, what comes out at the end, we then work with the student group to sort of consolidate this as sort of this one pager. And there's of course much more details behind it where we talk about the problem statement, the description, but you'll get to see how many students were involved what were the key technologies or key methods? And then we'll provide links to the blog that the student group wrote, any documentation, what were their final presentation. But in, in the bottom, we'll highlight the three to five key insights that we got, whether it was a process, it was a technology solution, it was something about the method of how it was solved, and we'll share this. Now, a big part about all of this is uh, sort of sharing it both, as I mentioned at the start, to our internal Honda community and to our external community. 
Uh, you'll see we have a growing LinkedIn channel uh, through 99T Labs. We will give shout outs to the students. I think it's very beneficial to them. You know, this is this is great proof for them as they're getting out into the workforce, trying to uh, maybe get jobs or whatnot. Uh, we want we want to share it with our university network. We want to share it with our other outside collaborators so that new ideas can be inspired. But we do have a public facing blog, uh, which we then leverage as a way to share inside Honda also. And uh, the other key thing, and being a Japanese company, we convert all of that content to Japanese so that a lot of our uh, headquarter folks can also read, participate, and then join, at least from an insights point of view. So anyways, uh, I just wanted to share this uh, little bit of a detail as to how uh, we think about it. And Chris, I'll hand it back to you to maybe help uh, dive into some of the more detailed questions here. That is phenomenal. Uh, Dwayne or Jeeves, thanks so much for you know for helping to frame that out. And the, again, it's like the care in the process that you and your team put together on like it's such a core component of how your team operates. Like that to me is just amazing. So thank you for taking the time to do that. Um, so I'd love to also now kind of open things up to allow the faculty and the programs to just kind of talk through some of the questions. I know that we were talking earlier before this meeting and, and Rajiv and Dwayne, I know you guys hit on a ton of things that likely intersect and interweave into the conversation. Um, I think one of the key questions that I see from companies, uh, certainly when they're just wondering even how do we start engaging with CMU? Uh, what, what, what would you say both for the value for the company and the value for the student, the role of the capstone, what would you say the benefit is for the company and for the students? Oh, um, I'll, I'm going to jump on one other thing you said there uh, as well, but uh, first let me tell the value again, the value for the student, and you heard, you heard a lot of values come from the details that were given. So not only does it move, our research agenda forward. It allows us to prioritize, right? It allows us to focus our internal resources much better. It gives us new insights that we didn't have and wouldn't get any other way. Also, there was a, there was a big talk about talent acquisition and talent retention. One fact is that you're working with these fantastic students and there's no better way for someone to demonstrate their capabilities and through one of these capstone programs. And they will, you, you will truly see students shine. The other one is it engages your folks tons. Now, now, to your other point of the students is, um, and I find this, I find personally engaging with the capstone is very energizing, rewarding. The students repeatedly say how much they enjoy working on these problems. And a lot of times we're not talking about how Honda might make a better product in the future. Almost none of ours focus on that. They're more about how will society be better? How can, what are the problems of future society and how can we make that future society a better place for everyone that lives in it? And that really gives the students passion to work on the project, I feel. Carolyn, I'll let you add into that as well. Yeah, I really appreciated a lot of what Dwayne and Rajiv um, presented about their capstone experience. It really resonated with me and I think is very consistent um, with our MCDS experiences as well. I would say that um, one slight difference that I would say kind of captures the MCDS capstone thrust is it's really very data focused. And so um, both in terms of the value to the students and faculty, because working with industry gives us access to data sources, real world data sources that might not be publicly available. But then on the side of the companies, they have access to really the cutting edge of the developing technology. And especially these days, technology is really advancing so quickly. And what I have seen is that um, you know, these engagements between companies and our capstone students really allow the companies to jump on the re most recent advances. Our students always have their eyes on the horizon, the latest tool, the latest um, advance, the latest published uh, result. And um, I would say that, you know, something to kind of hang on to as a company is considering um, where does it make sense in the landscape of what our company is paying attention to, to think about a capstone, I would say a theme is making data work for you. Um, what I have seen teaching machine learning over the past decades is that more and more companies have accumulating data sources that they may or may not be capitalizing on. And I think that, um, you know, companies have become increasingly aware of the extent to which that data uh, can um, do work for them, can make money for them, can give them really valuable 
insights and abilities to do things that they wouldn't have been able to do before. And that's why I have seen as an instructor of machine learning, people from every discipline coming and learning about machine learning. These allow industries to touch the latest um, things to learn about. Um, keep it because you have to keep your eye on the horizon. I, you know, first was learning machine learning 35 years ago. Um, in some ways, uh, it, it never changes, but in other ways, it's changing every day. And so, this is the way to really make data work for you while really tapping into the latest and greatest. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, I, th I think one of the when I'm thinking back in my own experience just addressing capstones as a, as a topic. Like when I was in the industry, I didn't know, like no one else in the company was really working with universities at the time. So this was all very new. And I'm sure lots of companies experience this because I get this question a lot, but when it comes to the setting of expectations with companies, as far as the different pathways of engagement with the university, I know there's sponsored research and, and you, for those who are in the audience, you may have heard of sponsored research, like what that thing is. Uh, today we're talking about capstones. Uh, so I guess I'm curious from the faculty, like in your perspective, like how do you start setting expectations with companies as far as the level of effort that comes from the students and even what should the company be bringing to the picture? I mean, ideally, is this a two-way street where both are engaged? I'd like to know your thoughts. I can jump in on that one quickly. Oh, sorry, Nick, if you want to take it, that's fine. Okay, so I'll just say something quickly about it. Uh, I think what I typically say is that we want to have the sponsors uh, uh, involved on at least having a regular meeting. Uh, ideally, it'd be at least once a week. Sometimes it ends up being every two weeks, but certainly no less frequently than that. And if they're in the Pittsburgh area, of course, then they can uh, be on campus and actually uh, physically present for some of the demonstrations and things like that more easily. Uh, and in terms of the amount of time, I would say at least in our program, uh, students tend even though this probably starts to edge towards violating what the uh, the the curriculum specifies in terms of the number of hours worked per week, uh, maybe twenty hours a week on the project. Uh, I think it's a twelve unit or it's a fifteen unit course now. We're trying to be more realistic. Did you want to add something? Yeah, yeah. Just add a little bit there too about what um, I, I usually try with with our capstone partners. Um, it's similar. Um, we we are available for uh, kind of a very two way communication. We like having the sponsors involved. Um, in years past, we've had that sometimes be just maybe like a, a, a engagement in the design reviews. We have three in my class, for example. Uh, but with other years, um, we've had people come to every team leaders meeting. So we have a weekly team leaders meeting where we're going over the project, going over updates. Um, that's actually a great way for a capstone partner to get involved, to understand how the project's progressing, to really see what the students are are directly working on, and then also to to provide some of their own expertise, right? Whether it's from industry, um, many of the many times within my course, we're working with um, teams who have scientists, engineers on their end, and they can provide um really great firsthand experience um, that I, I can't even provide. Um, and for the students, that can be really, really um, beneficial for them to actually see what it's like out um, in sort of the real world and even outside the classroom and to, to get that sort of feedback. Let me jump in real quick on a comment here, just 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 for the industry folks too. And, and this is something, again, that I think I've learned over time as we participate. Um, resist, I will, I will advise you for, from an expectation standpoint is the students may ask you what to do. And they may ask you to help them solve problems, right? And, and help them make decisions. Absolutely refuse. So you need, they, you, you need to push it back on them. They need to come to you with the solutions. They need to solve the problems. That's how you're going to get the most, they're going to get the most value and you're going to get the most value. Just, just the best practice there. And uh, Chris, I, I wanted to jump back to the earlier question, just give one brief statistic. Uh, this is related to what the students and the companies get out of it. Uh, I would say, I don't have the numbers exactly here, but a large number of students who work with the company or project will then end up doing an internship with them. I do know that for my program, between 30 and 40% of students end up working uh, full-time at the company for which they interned. That's huge. That's awesome. I'll, I'll mention even again, to, to carry on to that comment, we've had several cases where 
we've brought the interns in after finishing the capstone to continue working on some aspect of the capstone that they were very passionate about. And that again, turns into a win-win situation. Yeah, it sounds like there's so many learnings that we're even just getting from the initial conversation here as far as uh, just thinking of the value that the capstone engagement is. And I mean, I think we've seen it before where companies might engage in a capstone, but by engaging, it's they just fund it and maybe throw a problem out there, but then they're not really having people on their side, like really engaging with the students on a regular basis. I mean, I guess when you think of, for, for the faculty, when you're thinking of the student experience, how significant is it to have the right person at the company engaging with that student team? Is that, like, how crucial is that? Or can you just like kind of support them on your end and it's still okay? Like, is it important to have the right person at the company engaged? Hey, I'll, Skip and I'll hop in here. So we, I mean, it's crucial to our students' experience to have engagement with, with our clients. We really rely on them to be our subject matter experts mm -hmm. and to help the students gain access to the resources that they're going to need. And we really encourage our clients to be that for the students' clients. You don't have to suddenly become um, professors at CMU. We have a team of faculty here that support all of our student teams. So we really encourage you to just be there to also learn from the students and share your knowledge knowledge and your resources with them um, so they can gain that real real life experience. Yeah, I would just add that the model that we use in the MHCI program is that the student team is at the center and around the periphery of the student team is the industry partner, whether it's Honda or um, Progressive Insurance or Bloomberg or NASA or any of the others we have. We also have um, capstone faculty that include real practitioners with decades of experience in a relationship at CMU that understand the curriculum that our students have experienced in the fall, so they know how to build on it. Um, and our capstone teams meet uh, with me, the director, uh, twice a week in capstone session, where we try to not uh, just deliver knowledge through lecture, but engage them in critique, um, presentation, uh, so that their skills are constantly being honed as they go back to uh, interact with the industry partner. Then, of course, the industry partner, in our case, has a primary and a secondary contact. So there's always continuity because inevitably people need to go on vacations and do family things, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so we want the students to not have, be delayed by the realities of uh, work life. And so we do that for uh, two semesters, about seven and a half months. That's great. Carolyn, I see a hand. Did you, do you, have, you wanted to add into it? Or yeah, I would just say that um, one of our really successful engagements with industry has been with Bosch. And um, uh, one of the things that I, I, I have appreciated about that is the way that um, this has been an ongoing relationship. It wasn't about sponsoring a one and done, um, a capstone, and it wasn't about the capstone being the be all and end all, but it was really an ongoing relationship with multiple points of contact um, with one central figure from the company sort of reaching out and wanting the company to have that engagement with the, the Language Technologies Institute, starting with a fellowship program for PhD students and growing into capstones and sponsored research. And, and, and you can see how, if you look at the papers that have come out of the work, that the interests and expertise of both sides have really come together and have blended. And it's really beautiful, um, I would say, almost like a piece of artwork where you see those um, perspectives coming together. And it's been a really rewarding relationship, I think, on both sides. And um, so I encourage people to think sort of very broadly. I know that um, the central organization in at the School of Computer Science that Chris um, works within is um, responsible for engagement with companies along multiple dimensions. And I think it's nice the way these can blend and grow into a really continuing relationship. Said it better. <laughs> yeah, and I just want to add on to what Carolyn said that, you know, not only do, do, do these kinds of projects help grow the partnership between the organization and our university, but I think it can also um, help us grow within Carnegie Mellon. So, you know, we are constantly looking for opportunities to take the output of one capstone project and make it the input to another in another program. Um, there's so many brilliant people on campus, so I think there's wonderful opportunities to 
you know, continue the learnings throughout different capstone programs across campus. One of the questions I know is maybe somewhat of a, like if a beginner is looking at capstones and trying to weigh options, like do I pursue a capstone? Should I pursue sponsored research? Maybe I've never engaged in either of these before. Uh, I'd be curious to know your own thoughts and how you've helped companies kind of decide, like, is this a good engagement for you? And I love how, I mean, I've heard this from multiple folks, Honda's living it out. And Carolyn, you gave some examples too of where companies are growing across campus. But when you think of sponsored research, it seems like a, it's a different animal. And how do you help a company understand like the value, like this is what a capstone would be ideal for versus sponsored research. Like how do you convey that with a company? Set those expectations. I can take this because I, I have I have done capstone and sponsored research with with uh, actually the same companies, but Honda in this case, but with other companies as well. Um, so the main difference that I usually speak to is that a capstone experience um, is something that you are excited to give a problem to students. This is something that's maybe not in your critical path, but if if something gets developed, it really could kick off some new ideas within your organization. And in addition you are okay with the students owning the intellectual property. Because with classes here at CMU, our students own their intellectual property. Now, you may negotiate with the students, not with me as their faculty member, but with the students, um, if you'd like to um, basically license that afterwards. But that's between you and a student and after they've graduated. Sponsored research, on the other hand, you would be signing up to work with a faculty member like myself and my research students, typically PhD students or maybe master's students who are working in my research lab. And that is a um, project that uh, is very research oriented. So you, we should be thinking about uh, research publications, sort of expanding knowledge in an area. And then in addition to that, though, you can negotiate the terms of the intellectual property. And oftentimes there's a, a shared intellectual property um, agreement. Uh, we, we, we do custom agreements, but there are also other agreements and you can you should reach out to the legal um, folks about that or other faculty, but um, that's another way to do that. Now, those engagements are often longer. Um, I have some engagements that last a year, some that are up to th three years. And so that's where you can build a really deep relationship, but typically with one faculty member and then maybe one or two students. Uh, to work very deeply on a specific project. Let me throw in something from the industry perspective here, and this is what I tell folks within Honda. Um, uh, number one, Capstone is a great point of entry. So it's like it, uh, sponsored research is a much bigger commitment. What I tell people is you need to be ready to, to give one meeting per week with that Capstone team. A lot of times, maybe you, it's every other week, but you need to be committed to be able to give one one week. And also, we typically look at visiting campus at least a couple times during the Capstone and even have the Capstone team visit us. Um, so it's a really great entry and, and there's a really diverse, so again, the brochure, Chris, that you mentioned and you've shared out is great. So I share that with folks at Honda. And then, and then the other good thing is, which Carnegie Mellon has done, is that all of those Capstone programs use the same agreement. And that never used to be the way, now it is, and it's so much easier. That means if you do one capstone with one group anywhere in the university, then you can easily do another capstone with another group. And, and because a lot of times that legal part is a big hurdle for industry side. And then finally, what I tell them is, okay, you're interested in a given capstone, go talk to the faculty, ask them, what, uh, ask them about previous projects. They're not gonna go into the details, but say, so give me some aspects of projects that really worked well, that you saw in the past and maybe some aspects of project that didn't work well and you can and usually the honda folks from that conversation with that faculty very informal um uh, can can determine whether or not that capstone program is a good fit for them and i've seen a lot of good success with that those are great comments oh sorry carolyn i just want to say one quick thing about ip uh what nick said and what Dwayne said were those, those are both excellent but the one additional thing is uh lest you feel like you don't have any IP advantages, you get what we call NERF rights, even when the students do a, a capstone project, meaning non-exclusive royalty free. So you can use the IP, you can use the project results, the software, whatever else. It's just that you don't have an exclusive right to it, although you could possibly negotiate that with the students after the project, as Nick also uh, alluded to. I just wanted to jump in and say um, for companies out there, maybe you don't know if you want to make this commitment, if it's worth it um, at this point, and you're not sure yet on, on your side what the value proposition is, but you have 
some ideas. I would encourage you to reach out for a conversation. I had a conversation the other day with a representative from a company, came to my office. We got out, uh, you know, pens and got went to my whiteboard and you know he came in with one idea but the conversation meandered and then in the end there were three ideas different from uh, the idea that he came in with and I think that you know you can come with a come talk to us and we can explore together and um there's no commitment necessary for having the conversation and and I'm all about the conversation I think great things come when people start to put their heads together and so I just invite companies that have never really made a commitment to a capstone in the past to come in and and talk to us and find out because we we can find a connection that maybe you don't didn't imagine yet but it comes out of the conversation Carolyn that's an awesome segue into even just like how, how does one approach forming a problem. And it sounds like maybe a conversation, just a lightweight conversation at the beginning is a great way to begin. And I guess I'm curious too, like how do you start, how do you as faculty start formalizing that? And is it appropriate? Like is the problem like not quite a good fit? Like how do you walk through a company that path? Well, one idea that I'll throw out there, this is, um, Maybe the flip side from what Duane had described, he pointed out what is true, that a capstone can be a great entry into maybe a sponsored research project later. However, it's also the case you can flip that around. There are some faculty members who've been working with companies for a long time, and then uh, they end up having an idea along with the folks at the company that they've been collaborating with for a while that might be suitable for a, a project in one of the capstones. And I've had that happen as well. So that's uh, doesn't directly answer your questions, Chris, but it's a scenario in which that kind of thing can happen in any of them. Yeah, I was just going to say that uh, shaping the problem that the students um, have to face is really kind of an art form. Um, I don't think we've reduced this yet to a set of rules or a science. I think the art form involves first advocating for the student. They're really at the center of everything we do. The problem has to be substantial, challenging. And it, for us, the horizon is about you know uh, three to five years away. It can involve doing things that are uh, unbelievable or magical, like going faster than the speed of light or defying gravity. Um, we want to work a little bit closer to a near future, um, and so it, it has to be substantial, challenging, and it has to allow for the students to use research methods to reframe the problem and understand it differently. Um, here we call it creating problems, not just creating solutions, but actually envisioning new ways that our industry partners can generate value through the application of HCI methods and associated technologies. Um, then from the sponsor side, um, we um, oftentimes get in conversations with them about how their organization is starting to mature as um, UX researchers, uh, product designers, service designers, et cetera because oftentimes the project is a vehicle for increasing awareness of HCI, which is a uh, human computer interaction is a profession that has been ascending for the past 30 or 40 years. Uh, more and more companies are adopting it and using it as part of their DNA for creating value as they are with everything that we see here, whether it's robotics or data science uh, or other programs. So we need to make sure that there's value coming back to the sponsor as well. Um, that's the quid pro quo and the kind of win-win that we're looking for from a program point of view. And once you have your, your statement discerned and you have an appropriate project for the students, do you mind enlightening a little bit more on like, how, how do you end up determining like which students are a good fit? And I mean, I have to imagine the students don't always have the same kind of background or skill set even, but how do you make sure you form up a like a really solid team for that for that company use project? Maybe that's an art. <laughs> yeah. I can start with how our master's program does it in the Human Computer Interaction Institute. So we start collecting data from the students upon their entry in the fall semester, um, considering the backgrounds that they've come from, um, their strengths, their areas of opportunity, and also where their interests are. So we gather all that data in the fall. And then at the end of the semester, they get to submit a 
pretty in-depth questionnaire um, that has all of our project descriptions from our portfolio of projects, which is usually about 11 to 13 projects a year. Um, students get to see each of those project descriptions that we just discussed mm -hmm. and suggest preferences um, for those projects or perhaps projects that they aren't as interested in. So we use all of that data. We talk to their faculty and then our team collates groups of usually about five students that will be on a student team. So they're multidisciplinary teams um, and they consider the areas where students also want to grow. And of course, if the project needs any special skills, perhaps we try to place a student that might have that background on that team as well. Um, but we, we have a lot of data points to consider in that mm -hmm. team building process. So suggestion for industry best practice. Um, do your best to be a good capstone mentor. Why do I say that? Because students talk. And if you get a good if you get a good reputation on campus with the students, then all the best students will want your project. So do your best. And 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 one of the, one of the things I'd say about that is again, it's the engagement, supporting the students, providing information, providing connections. Also, the problem statement's not written in stone. And we've had because we've come, we've crafted a hypothesis with the faculty, and the students are like, "Yeah, this is bunk." Okay. Prove to us that, that that hypothesis is false, and then pivot, right? Don't don't pivot without proving it, or we'll, we're gonna we'll call you out on it. Yeah, just a couple of things. First of all, I think our, our process in MCDS is very similar to um, what Jessica was saying about MHCI. Um, but uh, I just want to add like a few extra things. First of all, um, in response to what Dwayne said, I think that's true. It's absolutely true that the students talk and that uh, it's a good, uh, it's important to be committed to, to keeping the students first. On the other hand, I would say, um, remembering that a long, long time ago, I was a capstone instructor in MHCI. And I remember that there were a couple of sponsors that um, it, it, it were challenging to work with, but the students really learned from that. They may not have been happy, but they learned something. And I do recall that um, actually part of the design of these capstone projects, um, which uh, we've kept in MCDS, and I remember discussing it when I was involved in the MHCI one, is that we wanted it to be a long enough engagement that at some point that student group would break down because it was in the breakdown and putting the pieces back together that the best learning occurs. But it's also where sometimes the kind of innovation that never would have come except in a, in a kind of breakdown situation comes. Like all of a sudden it broke some assumption and now the real uh, spark comes and and the great things um, came out of it in in the end. So uh, I don't think you should try to be difficult, but at the same time, I think don't worry if uh, you think that the situation is, is not going to be um, perfect. But one thing to uh, note, I think that which is true all across the School of Computer Science, our standards of admission are very high because our programs are in such high demand. So first of all, the students that we get here come in very qualified, and many of them already have substantial industry experience someplace else that they're bringing with them in some relevant domain. Plus, the programs themselves are designed such that by the time the students get to their capstone, there's some kind of foundation that every student in the program has. And so we can assume that everyone has that. But then uh, all of the programs have a way of students specializing. And so that gives the opportunity at the beginning when we do the surveys, just like Jessica was saying they do in MHCI, to find out what are those unique capabilities that students have. And oftentimes students want to be on a project where they have an, a, an opportunity to capitalize on their unique strength. So it really works both ways in terms of the students ranking projects according to interest, but also the surveys that we have on the faculty side. And so we have a lot to work with when we've talked to a sponsor and we know the requirements of the project and we're going to curate a team that's a really good fit from the pool that we have. We know we're going to have that raw material because of the design. It's not random. We know what we, you know, because we've, we've created these resources coming in and then we can curate them for these projects to maximize success. I want to pause for a quick second for anyone in the audience. Uh, please feel welcome to continue adding uh, your questions to the Q&A just to get those in before I know we're getting to the top of our hour here. Uh, 
I, I have a question as well I want to throw out there uh, regarding recruiting. And I know that was something that I was excited about when I was getting on campus. Uh, admittedly, I think when students heard about American Eagle Outfitters when I was working there, they thought of the stores. And initially they were like, I, I don't want to work in a store. I was like, Hold up. There's actually all this other work that happens in the background with technology. We'd love to tell you more about it. So I guess when I think of recruiting is definitely uh, an aspect of Capstones. Uh, how else do you help companies engage with the class? Are there other ways? Um, you know, there's a lot of students in the program that you're that you're overseeing. How do you help companies engage with those students? I can mention one quick thing that we do. It's not directly connected with the capstone course, but I have Friday lunchtime sessions where uh, students are somewhat less likely out of class and therefore there are fewer conflicts and invite companies to present. It might be over Zoom as was more common during the COVID period, or sometimes they're able to come in person and talk about what the opportunities that exist at their company are. And that's been very welcomed by the students. Awesome, John. Um, and admittedly, John, I know that you do something else too, but uh, you you send something out, I think, to companies. So something you might touch on that briefly. Yeah. So uh, I I send out two emails basically to the distribution list on which I have over four hundred companies now. Uh, one of them is the resume books for the students that are seeking internships and full time positions. And then the other one is a request for project candidates for the capstone course that we've been talking about or the, the group of capstone courses we've been talking about. That's awesome. Thank you. Uh, Rajiv, I Chris, I'll, yeah, Chris, I'll just jump in. You know, it's sort of a little bit tied to your question right now and a little bit of the relationship building part with the student groups to something that we do very often now than not is it's always the first meeting when the project kicks off. We never actually talk about the problem statement. We like to really connect with the students. So we, we really focus on what their stories have been, what their background life, what, what's their interest areas. We rarely talk about the problem statement on day one. Now, I will say that, uh, excuse me, because of our proximity to Pittsburgh, it's very easy for us to get to campus. So very often than not, you will find us on campus having lunch, dinner, breakfast with the student group. So there's a lot of connectivity that we build up. And then just building on the idea that students talk in their communities, the word spreads fast also, both from a high level. Oh, you need this. You should talk to my friend over here. Or you need this. You should go for, talk to this person here. Or we can help you out. So that those those in-person meetups really helps is, is from both hiring point of view and also from uh, trying to solve the current capstone project. And I will say, I think Dwayne and I, Dwayne will attest to this too. We've had some of the best, we've gone to some of the best restaurants in Pittsburgh. It's always <laughs> new to explore something over there. We will echo, Carolyn, that the power of food is great. And yeah. um, similar to what you're hearing, we try to open the opportunity to meet our entire cohort of students um, in addition to that capstone team that you're working with. And we can do that through various methods, be it you know, an informal information session, coming and having food with them, um, a fireside chat style, We're really open. Um, but we want you to be able to meet the entire cohort and not just your student team. I love it. I mean, really setting up these informal ways of companies and, and students to engage and uh, building those relationships. It's just, it's perfect. I love, I love that approach. And uh, I, as I look at the clock, I know we're heading up to the hour here. Um, any last thing that, you know, I'll open up for, again, Honda and for the faculty, if there's anything you'd want to touch on before I start wrapping us up today, I really enjoyed our conversation. I'll, I'll I'll say one last thing from the industry side. And again, it goes to you were talking about what makes a good student team, and and I'll just throw it again. It's not, it's not something I've noticed or observed is um, when when I ask folks to be co mentors for a capstone, and especially they're folks that might have might have been around Honda for a while, and 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 maybe um have a lot of connections in a large network, and somebody who's who's part of their team who's not who's relatively new and but excited about the aspect of being here and having them work together as a team. Um, I've seen 
be a really great dynamic. So if you can, if you can do that, and then diversity is also fantastic as well too, both from the team standpoint on both sides. So the more diverse combinations that you can bring together with your team at the industry as mentors with the capstone team, the, the, the more awesome the results are going to be. So just again, something ob observed over, over several years. Maria was able to send a quick question to us and is wondering uh, what role does the industry sponsorship play in shaping paradigms in science? You have to think for a minute, right? <laughs> I can uh, maybe start a little bit. So I think this depends on the, the faculty and then the, the well, the capstone. Um, so, uh, Myself being kind of from a, a more engineering oriented discipline, we're often interested in applied um, problems. A good problem can actually spur really good research. Um, sometimes, you know, it comes from, you know, good research, good science comes from the curiosity of the, the scientist. Um, but sometimes it comes from like, hey, there's this thing that we want to solve. And then that can uh, lead to a lot of great research questions that might then get asked. And I think this has been brought up a couple times now in this discussion that Capstone experiences can actually be the, the, the jumping point for larger scientific engagements um, with faculty or even within your own company. I mean, you could take things back to your organization and say, we want to build on this. We want to explore this more. And the capstone is a really good way to like try things out because it's in, in most cases, it's fairly low risk. Um, it is depending on, you know, your, your level of um, funding, it can be very low cost. Um, and so I think that there's some, um, you know, nice things that happen there um, to allow uh, the industry sponsor to sort of bring an interesting problem uh, to to uh, CMU uh, to allow us to try to start something there. I'll 100% agree with what Nick just said. Um, and again, I was talking about the value proposition there as well. So we've seen we've seen capstone subjects that were successful in a capstone lead to sponsored research. So that's affecting the future of science somewhat. Also, they turn into internal, so they'll turn into a research projects with the institute. And quite often now, um, our partners in the government are asking the industry, where what what's the what are the problems for future society? We want to see government wants to encourage university and industry to work together. So again, I think the the insights and learnings that come out of capstones can influence all those agendas going forward. Yeah, that's just phenomenal to know that uh, capstones can really have a far reaching impact, you know, beyond the project that's defined just for the company. That's just, that's just phenomenal. Um, it's been really, it's been my pleasure and I want to, we can start wrapping up for today's uh, event, but it's just been wonderful to, again, bring you folks together. I've, I've learned so much, not just from today's call and hopefully those who attended on today's event were able to walk away with learning a little bit more around the value of the capstone. And if, if your company uh, organization has never engaged with the university, it, it is a fun, really fun way to start your relationship with, with CMU. So um, that's my selfish hope is that if you found that any of these immediate uh, capstones and the fact that you're chatting with here on this uh, event, if they strike a chord, please reach out. You know, uh, I think they would, all the faculty I'll speak for them would enjoy connecting with you. Uh, if you're unsure how to navigate the waters of the university and you're wanting to talk to someone, that's where the team I'm on come, comes into play. So I'm part of a corporate partnerships team um, and also with government. So George Rocco's who leads the team, Dan Jenkins and I uh, both work with industry and it's our passion. Um, so as we think about ending up today's, wrapping up today's event, uh, I, I do want to highlight some resources that you have uh, for folks who are uh, watching today. So uh, it's been mentioned that there's a brochure. So hopefully as you registered for the event today, you received the brochure in your email inbox. Um, if you haven't, you can still visit the web for it. So if you go to uh, a URL that um, I'll actually share it in the chat right now, so you can also see it here. But if you go to www cs.cmu.edu forward slash academics forward slash capstones. Uh, this website was designed to help 
uh, really bubble up the capstones within the School of Computer Science, and you can even um, you know sort them and, and open them up and learn about the descriptions. There's a brochure there as well for you to, to download. So um, without further ado, as we look at wrapping up now, uh, just really thank you again, each of you for taking the time to, to, to participate. So Dwayne, Rajiv, thank you for your time representing Honda and just the amazing relationship you've set up with us at campus at CMU. Um, I appreciate all the faculty taking their time and how you take care of industry partners. You did such a great job. And that's why I wanted you to talk today. You, you've blown it out of the water. So, uh, you know, Skip and Jessica, thank you for representing MHCI. Uh, Nick, I appreciate you representing the rapid prototyping uh, program. And uh, Carolyn, thank you for representing the uh, Masters of Computational Data Science. And then lastly, John, really thank you so much for representing the Masters of Robotic Systems Development. Having said all that, thank you for taking time out today to listen in and learn about capstones at Carnegie Mellon University and the School of Computer Science. Look forward to hopefully seeing you on campus soon.